Welcome to the Tazzy Athlete Podcast. My name's Dominic, I'm your host and the founder of TA. Today we're joined by endurance athlete Annabelle de Jong, who shares her love for getting lost on the Tazzy trails and the careful balance between mental health and running. Thank you very much for joining us here today, Annie. Um, it's good to have you on board and i um, incredibly fortunate to have you as a Tazzy Athlete podcast guest. I'm interested though, before we kick off, have you ever done a podcast before? No, never. This is your first. Listen to them all the time. What's never um, been on one. What have you got on a rotation at the moment, podcast-wise? Uh, I sort of switch between running-oriented ones. So Hidden Athlete's a really good one. Um, what else am I on at the moment? It's funny how you think of them all the time. Um, training for Ultra, um, anything with Rich Roll, Coach Coop's a really good one. And then I also go back to one called Life Uncut, which is all girl stuff, all relationship stuff. So absolute polar opposites, <laughs> depending on what mood, what mood I'm in. It's, um, I can't say I've heard of any of those, but maybe I'll have to expand my mm. podcast mm-hmm. listening. So. Especially Life Uncut, really Life helpful. Uncut. Yeah. Is it, that was the girl one? Yeah. Okay. I could perhaps learn quite a fair <laughs> bit, expand my horizons. To... I think the girls would appreciate it. <laughs> like I said, thanks very much for, for joining us here today. Um, we've obviously got you on to talk about your background as an endurance athlete, but also mm-hmm. so going to dip the toes into your experience, I guess, relationship with mental health and, mm-hmm. and dealing with that. But before we get started, I, I can't say I'm an endurance athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely when people I say that I'm a runner people are always like oh how far do you run like what's your event and I say I'm actually a track athlete so a little bit different to the sort of yeah. area that that you sit in so yeah. what's your what was your background to getting into the the endurance sort of events I guess I kind of grew up doing a lot of bushwalking but I was never particularly sporty through school I was I guess I was fit I had a good natural fitness but I've never been coordinated <laughs> I'm hopeless when it comes to anything with balls or hands and arms and legs at the same time so um, I didn't really start pursuing anything until I was sort of mid-teens I started going to the gym with my dad and then at some point just decided that I want to give running crack Um, hadn't really been distance or a sprinter growing up um, and just started on a treadmill just doing intervals and then very quickly decided oh I'll do a 10k so I did Bernie 10 I think at this point I was 18 and then already got the bug. So from Bernie Tan, I then did Cadbury Half and then almost immediately after that got shin splints. So I had a great three months and then had, I reckon, eight months off with shin splints after that. Um, And then sort of dabbled in things, but it wasn't until I moved to Canada that I actually started taking it more seriously. So I did a marathon training clinic um, then I think that was 2014, um, and did my first marathon in, uh, Vancouver. Um, and then I did Ventura, which is in California and then Victoria, which is in BC the same year. And then knew the next year after that, that I wanted to try ultras. So I very quickly realized that I was more suited to the longer stuff. Um, but it really wasn't until my early twenties that I started training and loving it i think yeah. and really starting to identify with it this um the getting addicted sounds like mm-hmm. it is quite a familiar thing mm-hmm. for endurance athletes where you dip the toe in the water a little bit and then it's like hey yeah. this is actually this is actually pretty cool yeah it hurts a lot i can imagine for the first time but it hurts all the time <laughs> it hurts every time <laughs> is that is that part of the appeal yeah for sure i think you you really do get addicted to that pain it's a bit um it's not the, the nicest downing addiction, um, but you do end up just sort of craving it. You crave those hard efforts. You crave the challenge. Um, and it's almost as if if you don't get one every sort of week or two, I know for myself, if I don't have some sort of epic adventure every week or two, something doesn't quite feel right. Um, it is, it's just, it's just drug. I, I don't know whether it's endorphins or just the, the, like the feeling of achievement, but you do very much learn to to love it i can imagine there will hopefully be a few endurance athletes out there listening to this podcast hopefully. and they're all probably got a warm fuzzy feeling they're like yes that's <laughs> me that's me that's exactly i'm sure I it feel. sounds mad to everyone else <laughs> it, look from my experience having only picked up the bike 
over because you also ride as well mm-hmm. or yeah yeah do do definitely I dabble. dabble in Mostly the riding when I'm, injured. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very keen to touch on the ride that i've heard that you've done uh shortly but i know for me there's definitely a different feeling i, I picked up the bike like a lot of people did during mm-hmm. covid and have absolutely loved it so far and mm-hmm. the bank balance has taken a bit of a hit because mm. it is yep. a, not a cheap sport but <laughs> yep. um i I went for a ride yesterday, first time in a, in a little while, which is good, very, very short one. But there's such a different feeling. I can finish a track session and I'm, I'm done, like written off. Mm-hmm. But it's it's almost like it's a, a different sort of pain to the fatigue, really. I, I was mm. walking down the stairs after yesterday's ride. And mm-hmm. even that is a struggle. So mm. I, can, I can certainly relate to that feeling of, I don't want to say exhaustion, but it's definitely a different feeling than from a series of sprinting efforts or just going out for a jog to yeah. doing something, something yeah. epic. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, you can push yourself hard in a 3K. You can push yourself hard in a, a half an hour track session. But they're different. The different muscles, the different exercises, it's apples and oranges to a big extent. So when we talk about this, like what what's a... Perhaps can you tell me like some of the the distances or the times or like what's a, what's a typical <laughs> run, Fanny? You got out this morning. I got mentioned. out this morning, so I did thirty k's this morning. <laughs> um, at the moment, because I'm leading up to quite a big race, um, I'm averaging around one ten to one sixty k's a week, um, depending on how much free time I've got and how bored I am. <laughs> Being a student and only working part time, I'm quite privileged in the amount of time I can dedicate to training. And at the moment, too, I guess in the last few months or so, or really in the last 12 months, my training has changed from being quite structured to being more, what do I want to do today? So I wouldn't say I have an average run, it's usually planned 24 to 48 hours in advance, dictated by the weather. Um, and I just use it as a way to go out and explore more. But I do love, love my longer runs. Um, it takes me a while to move up, to, to warm up. Um, I was joking to a friend, it takes me about 15 Ks to start feeling comfortable. Yes. <laughs> so at the moment, I don't really do anything shorter just because I really like reaching that flow state. Is, is there something as you said, you know, you sort of gone for a bit more of a structured routine to a little bit more of a free flowing mm-hmm. approach to running. Is how's that been for you? Do you find it's it's nicer? Do you perhaps like the structure a little bit more? I think I used to really rely on the structure, um, but there was a lot of pressure and a lot of guilt around it. And if I wasn't ticking those boxes and completing those sessions and getting a certain amount of Ks or a certain amount of minutes in, I would feel really, really guilty about it. Um, Whereas I've, I've tried to step back from that because it was taking the joy out of running for me. I wasn't coming out of those sessions feeling like that was great. I had a really good time. I was coming out of it exhausted and it was so strict. Um, and no one was implying that pressure except for me. It was completely self-imposed. I've never had a coach. Um, and I wanted to go back to playing again. I wanted to go back to loving what I was doing because that's why I started running in the first place. And you feel like you're back on that path now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really do feel like my runs are playful, which is, you know, I I feel like as adults, I use that term loosely, (laughs) we, we lose that not so much ability, but I don't think we allow ourselves to play anymore. Um, I don't know why, but I can really recommend it. <laughs> no, I think that's very, very wise words. And, and we do look particularly, you know, obviously very fortunate. Someone like yourself, the events that you tackle are, are bigger events. And mm-hmm. you know, so there's the element of, of seriousness. You, know, you mentioned before about your, your housemate, um, Ben. Mm-hmm. I don't know who Ben is, as I always refer to him as Cov. When you said Ben before, <laughs> I'm like, hang on a sec, who's Ben? But um, someone like Ben, obviously has has shifted his mindset almost the opposite in the past sort of yeah. two years to being that regimented yeah strict so there's certainly the element for that but no i think i love hearing the fact look I, I i'm exactly the same i've thrown thing on its head and if i don't want to ride because work's busy or because i've got other things to do then mm-hmm. that that's fine mm. so, and it, it's kind of nice it, it does relieve that pressure and yeah so yeah i mean we have structure from so many other things in our life whether it's work or family or relationships, it's 
it's nice to have something that's a bit more flexible. You've got to have balance, I guess, if you can allow it. I mean, some of us take the sport more seriously than others, but I'm never going to be a pro. I'm never going to be the best. It's not why I do it. So It's funny, obviously very privileged in Tassie Athlete to have a range of athletes um, so far, both through mm-hmm. the articles and, and the podcast and looking mm-hmm. to expand the range as well. But um, people like Scotty Bowden, et cetera, like Mm -hmm. Olympic-level athletes do talk about how if you're not happy outside of your sport, how much that actually impacts the sport itself. So it's almost like an inverse equation that people are there absolutely grinding themselves to the ground, trying to achieve the limits in the sport. But things outside of the sport, whether it's diet, mental health, you know, work-life balance aren't in check, Mm -hmm. then, yeah, it actually is Mm. is doing the opposite. The body doesn't understand the difference between mental or physical stress. Stress is stress. So if you've got something going on outside of the sport, it's always going to have an impact. You can't separate the two, really, as much as we would like. Yeah, absolutely. And and so you're finding that having that flexibility in your your running program at the moment is, is almost helping the yeah. other elements of life too yeah it does um running for a long time has been my solution to everything it's what i do when i'm happy when i'm sad when i'm procrastinating when i'm celebrating um so i think yeah my relationship with it is a lot more positive now that it's it is fun um that i don't have a schedule to it necessarily it's not to say that's all always how I'll approach it, but I have certainly felt that um, I've fallen back in love with it in the last six months or so. That's yeah. good. And that's, that's really fitting because when we spoke before doing the podcast today, mm-hmm. um, something that really fascinated me was, yeah, as you mentioned before, you jumped ship and, and moved to Canada mm-hmm. and that you joined a running clinic over there. and. Mm-hmm instead of you obviously had a love for running at that time but something that that really stood out for me was that you saw running or joining that group as a way to experience a place can Mm. you tell me a little bit about what that was like for you um I guess by that point I had been in Canada for five or six months um I'd made connections through working but you know as someone who was traveling um I found myself with a bit of a disconnect between myself and the community, my partner at the time, and I had quite different interests. Um, and so I thought, what what can I do to start meeting people and people that were more similar to me and how I felt that I identified. Um, and joining this clinic, I'm still friends with people that I met there and, you know, people from all different backgrounds, um, mostly a little bit older because I was early 20s at the time and, Distance running very much is a more middle-aged person sport, it seems. Um, But I was able to connect with, you know, doctors and um, government workers and people who I would never have the opportunity to speak to otherwise, really. Um, And we went through this experience together and you have tough days and you have tough runs and you want to stop and um, a number of us got injured on the road to to Vancouver, Um, but it was such a good feeling to finish together. And then I guess those runs, because we were training um, three or four days a week and they would be mostly set runs, allowed me to see parts of the city that I probably wouldn't have explored otherwise, especially because it was new. Um, And then because I did another one uh, in California, and I've since done them in other parts of Australia as well, and use it while traveling. You see places at a slower pace. You go down roads that you probably wouldn't drive down. You make eye contact with people that you wouldn't have the chance to. It, um, I really like it as a way to explore a new place as long as you don't get lost, which definitely has happened. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to ask, is there a story there that you'd like to share? or? Oh, um actually probably one more recently um i do most of my runs by myself especially nowadays and i was on flinders island over new year's and i tried to go and climb killer cranky which is a mountain up the north and i knew there was an old trail so i went and found 
what I thought was this old trail and I just ended up in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and there was no phone reception and I did wonder how that was going to end. Luckily, eventually made my way to the top with some bush bashing. Um, but I mean, you come away and any story is a good story, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm here laughing about it now. <laughs> I'm sure every endurance athlete out there has a, a similar story oh, yeah. where they've, they've yeah. taken a wrong turn somewhere. I'd rather get lost in the bush than turn down the wrong street in a city, I think. Yeah, very true. Do you think that there's... like you mentioned about obviously going overseas, joining this this running clinic and being a part of running groups and it's a great mm-hmm. way to see a place. I mm-hmm. feel like there's been an absolute emergence of running groups here in Tassie, let alone Australia, let alone yeah. worldwide. And you've yeah. got things like Parkrun obviously. But, yeah. but do you think that there is something a little bit more special about these running groups now where, yeah, it is about running, it's about getting fit or achieving your goals, but mm-hmm. it's actually about meeting other people and yeah yeah absolutely and it has running's become cool again um it yeah there are so many groups so many more events and you go to these events and you see just the biggest diversity of entrants um i think there's a great camaraderie and it is really hard to make connections nowadays Um, it's something that people our age definitely talk about because you know you're relatively fresh out of school or some sort of education where friends are just thrust upon you and then you get to adulthood and you have your workplace you might sort of lose contact with a bunch of your school friends and it can be quite lonely and it's hard to meet people who are like-minded unless you join these groups um, or unless you have some sort of interest that facilitates it and these running groups I mean like I said it, it introduces you to people from a great spectrum um, I know some of my friends, like one of my closest friends is a mid 30 year old tradie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we have the greatest chats. So it, it is, yeah, there is something really special about the mind space of runners and just, I don't know, I guess I'm biased towards runners, but, um, the experiences you share as well on those runs or training for events and yeah, yeah, it is very cool. I think it is such a nice balance, as you said, you know, whether it is in the build up to an event or just someone starting on their fitness journey. And mm-hmm. so um, it does bring a, an eclectic group of people together. <laughs> and um, but we talked before about you've also spent some time on the bike, which mm-hmm. I also find incredibly impressive. I'm not going to, I don't want to jump from A to B here. I'd love to, to hear about your journey, but one of the one of the things that I really love, and I have said this to you before, is the day that you trekked from around the Hobart area mm-hmm. down to Cloudy Bay on Bruny Island mm-hmm. and back, I believe. Yeah. Is this, how, how does this come about? Uh, the first time I rode from Hobart to Bruny, I was fairly fresh into riding. Um, I'd made friends through my workplace at the time with a couple of really accomplished riders. And they had it planned and it would be a pretty easy ride for them but I was a little bit ambitious and rode down with them and I remember exactly the point where I hit 100 k's it was the first time I'd rode 100 k's on my bike and I was so proud and went to uh the brewery um and had an awesome cheese sandwich it went down very well um And it was the same sort of thing with running. It was, I realized early on that I was built for longer rides. I'm not fast. (laughs) I like to ride long and then eat all the snacks that come with it. Um, The other time I've ridden down to Bruni was a bike packing trip. So rode to Hobart, rode around the north and then down to Cloudy Bay, overnighted on Bruni. And then the next day did the lighthouse, Adventure Bay, and then back to Hobart. So... I guess I'm lucky in the fact that I have the ability and the stubbornness to back it up. (laughs) I think there's definitely a bit of stubbornness required. Absolutely. I'm even thinking just the ride from Cloudy to Adventure Bay is, is, Mm. yeah, even up over Mm. the back road, I'm assuming you went or the... No, over the main roads. I was riding a roadie at the time. Yeah, okay, that's... that's, Yeah. Yeah, even more I can't believe I rode 90 k's before I had my first coffee of the day. That's the bigger accomplishment, (laughs) to be honest. Getting some true insight into this cycling life. (laughs) now (laughs) no i think the fact that 
yeah, you ticked over your hundred again. I having only got into cycling, I remember the first time that, that Andy Andy Goyan and myself did a hundred, and it is mm-hmm. it's an unreal achievement. It's yeah, like, this is halfway to Launceston. I, thought, I always think of it as like, yeah, how yep. far on the trip to Launceston is yep. this? So yeah, you start to look at road signs very differently when yeah. you equate it to a run or a ride. The, the sure. worst bit is, and I'm not sure if you, you found the same thing, but I the, the ride that I did yesterday was to the Shot Tower, and I remember Andy and I got our bikes and we rode to the Shot Tower and thought we were sign us up for the tour because mm-hmm. this is this is you know the Hobart to the Shot Tower and back was 25 odd k and we were yep. we were flying and then I was like oh let's let's maybe try going to 50. Yep. And I remember we got to 50 and we were, we had the bonk. We were done. Oh, we yeah. ended up at the service station, smashing down four yep. power raids and a bag of lollies. And then yep. I think it was the very next rider. Like, okay, let's aim to get to 50 again. And mm-hmm. we're like, oh, we got to 50. And we're like, oh, do you want to keep going? Got to 60. We're like, oh, we're here. Let's keep going. And so I think we got to 75. And then it's probably about a month later, we rode to Possum Bay, which, which is 100. Yeah. But then it's like, now what? Yeah, yeah. It's um, you become insatiable. I think it's always, how much further can I push? How much further can I go? Um, it's especially when you're setting those limits yourself. It's hard. Yeah, I um, it's something that I struggle with is knowing how to rein yourself back in. I think. Do you think that you have a great benefit of being able to explore new places? Do you think that is one way of achieving that? for fulfilling that that need yeah it's a good incentive i think when you get to go and see somewhere that you haven't been um i certainly took advantage of the quiet roads through COVID and getting to go and see some some of those country back roads and towns that i hadn't been to in a long time or ever um yeah but there is a limit there's always a limit there is Mm. there is to combine all of sort of what we've just spoken about uh, I'm interested in just getting your thoughts. So we spoke about the social aspect of running and riding, obviously spoken about running and riding itself. I want to know your thoughts on Strava. (laughs) So I think that, you know, obviously I don't want to go down the path of of Instagram and Facebook. I think they have their benefits, but there's also Mm -hmm. some pretty solid negatives about those social media platforms. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before about how tough it is for people once they sort of age out, as I say, of school and of, you know, school level sport and getting into careers. But I feel like Strava sort of slots in the middle where it's not, it doesn't detract from the benefits of social media. Like it is that running, riding, multi-sport sort of Mm -hmm. app. But yeah, at the end of it, you can send a few comments in and you can see what others are doing. Look, I think it, it has its negatives as well. You can obviously get so caught up in Cov, Ben is doing this, therefore yep. I should be doing this. But and getting it, the QOMs. Getting, and, yeah, getting yeah. all of the, the, the achievements. But do you think there is also, just thinking about what you said before about the element of meeting people through sport, do yep. you think that something like Strava has a place where having recently joined the knockoff run club myself as a, a part-time member a little uh-huh. plug there for andy it was <laughs> nice to sort of do the run with people and then you know mm-hmm. you jump on strava and and you follow their journey yeah. as well so yeah it becomes a shared experience um it's cool you know when you do something like a, one of the big events where there's thousands and thousands of people you can look around you and and look at the the strava section where it says you ran with those people and you have that camaraderie and you might have spoken to those people and then you can connect like I've certainly had that happen to me through events in the past that now I follow these people and I see them regularly um yeah I think that's probably one of the more positive aspects to Strava I'm not a big fan of the app myself um it's certainly had its negative effects on my training in the past um but yeah it serves a purpose for sure no no definitely i know Mm -hmm. some people who are either yep live eat sleep breathe they'll (laughs) write a full essay yes cob i'm looking at you they'll write a full essay on their their training um in regards to strava i do enjoy a good strava caption though it's also a cov reference what's a what's a good caption though because there's there's chats around some of the circles that people are writing essays and it's getting a little bit out of hand i don't think we need the full breakdown of uh, how you were feeling and exactly what was going on in your stomach. 
So what's a good Strava caption? What do we? What oh, are we something for? funny. It's got to be funny. <laughs> it, it, You've any... got to deflect everything with humor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I don't. Everything that I post is private, so okay. none of my activities, unless it's something particularly epic, yeah. is everything's private now. Okay. So I do miss that aspect of making the captions. I do love a good pun, and I don't have the opportunity to throw them in there anymore. But I still look at it. And scroll through, and I still appreciate the effort that other people go to. I feel like there's such a fine balance. So you've got people out there who are specifically doing runs or segments just for Strava, just for to put sure. up the captions, yep. which is a little bit out of hand. Yeah, they go chasing segments. It, it's it is a it is a very careful balance. <laughs> so. You mentioned that Strava has had an impact on your mm-hmm. you know apps like Strava, or or comparing to others, perhaps have have had. Um, a bit of an impact on your training and mm-hmm. yeah how how that impacts your mental health as well yeah is that because of a comparison thing is it because yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you feel like somebody else is doing this therefore I should be doing this yeah or? and standards that I set myself as well I know that a big thing for me and this is very much a road running thing was pace making sure I was getting a certain pace for every run and this was primarily to when I hadn't really looked so much into how a week should be structured. You know, you should have a tempo session and a a faster session and then your long recovery runs or your slow recovery runs. If I didn't get below a five kilometer pace, it was a bad run and I wasn't good enough. Um, And then I was seeing what other people were doing that I was holding myself against. And again, it was pressure that I applied completely to myself. and I would become embarrassed and feel inadequate and it wasn't achieving anything. There was nothing positive there. It was I'm not a competitive person against other people. I'm only competitive against myself, which some people struggle to believe, but <laughs> I think is definitely true. Um, and it just wasn't, it wasn't serving a purpose for me. I didn't want the segments. I didn't want the crowns. Um, so I... I still am on there, but everything is private. So I can compare my previous efforts to myself, but other people's opinion and other people's value of those runs or sessions mean nothing. And I don't give them the opportunity to. Look, it's, I think it's a very common thing and Mm. and whether people, you know, I think it's obviously incredible that you speak so candidly and openly about it, but look, I know. (laughs) I think it is common. It is. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, um, if you don't mind me asking, here you mentioned it, it did impact you. What what did that look like on the ground for Annie? Was it that you just didn't feel like going out and training the next day? Did you go out and smash yourself even harder? Mm. Like what what did that impact actually look like for you? Yeah, I I was trying to meet certain targets and my body wasn't recovering, but my cycle was to just keep pushing harder and harder. And then I guess if I didn't meet those targets, then I would have the guilt and the stress and then that would feed back into it. And so eventually it would lead to me getting sick or me getting an injury. Um, And I joke that I'm probably the most injured (laughs) injured runner I've ever encountered. Um, But yeah, it just, it, I didn't get fitter. I didn't get stronger. I didn't get healthier. Um, It was just this negative feedback cycle continuously until I recognized what was going on and what was behind it, essentially. And that wasn't just Strava. That was um, just me and my high expectations of myself. (laughs) My old coach used to use the analogy, are you thriving or are you surviving? Yeah, And if you're surviving, it's um, Mm -hmm. obviously there are some other things Mm -hmm. to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So you've obviously had a bit of a journey with your body, which Mm -hmm. is the physical side of things, but also the mental aspect of, of running. I think, yeah, yep. you, you tapped into before how that that hit of finishing an absolutely epic run is, is the best thing about the sport. Mm-hmm. But that also the demands of whether it is just endurance running or, or being an athlete um, also takes its toll mentally. Mm-hmm. Is the, It's always a tough place to, to start in terms of, of that journey that you've had with, with mental health. But mm. yeah, is there any sort of moment for you that, that you really sort of sat back and were like, look, I need to 
perhaps work on the mind as well as the body? Was it sort of after the fact of, of something going wrong or has it been a... Um, that's a really good question. I, I have always been aware of the fact that for me, my pursuit of sport was pursuit of running in particular has been tied to my mental health. Um, I, it wasn't something, my mental health wasn't something that, um, came to the surface after I had started running. It was very much already there, um, and has very much been there for me my whole life. Um, and so I think when I found running, it made my experience of that better. Um, so it was a very positive relationship to begin with. Um, and then I don't think there was a moment where I realised I had to take it more seriously. I think it was probably more I was told that I started needing to think about the relationship and the connection more seriously by other people who recognised it sooner than I did. Um, and I would say really probably only in the last 12 months or so that I have started to be more respectful of that relationship. I've certainly been aware of it for a while, but awareness and respect are two very different things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just soaking it in here because mm-hmm. it, it's obviously, um, I, I feel like everybody has has a different experience with with both the journey and also, you know, as you said, respecting that, that mental health. But mm-hmm. you, you're obviously dealing with some mental health problems at the time. And I think that's great that running was, it sounds like it was the outlet for you in terms mm-hmm. of both understanding, but also getting a bit of relief from that. And mm-hmm. the next podcast that we're doing is, is going to be with Andy Allison, who's going to talk about mindfulness. So there's so many different strategies, which I think is great. At the mm-hmm. end of the day, you obviously want to be able to find something that really resonates with you and, and running or the endurance events were like that for you but you you're far down the path now and I feel like it's never like yep I found running therefore I am better it's, yeah. it's almost that you know ideally it's two steps forwards one step back but I feel like with mental health it's one step forward three steps back and then oh, you take it's never four linear. steps forward yeah. so how, what's the what's the journey been like for you in terms of understanding what's going on upstairs I was very fortunate in the sense that um, both my parents were in mental health as their career. Uh, my dad is a clinical psychologist, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that we would sit around the kitchen table and talk about our feelings, but um, it was certainly something that was um, openly communicated within my family. And um, I was a very anxious kid um, right up from when I was born. <laughs> I think, you know, it's certainly something that has been prevalent in my life um, as far as I can remember. And that sort of fed into depression um, almost as soon as I hit my teens. Um, so they're, they're two things and two conditions that I am honestly very comfortable talking about because they're intrinsically tied to my identity. I don't know myself otherwise, really. Um, and I, I guess that open communication in my family has really developed a want to remove the stigma and the discomfort that people have around talking about it because it is something that most of us experience directly or indirectly and the more we talk about it the more accepted it becomes um it unfortunately isn't the case that when you become an adult you have everything figured out as we sometimes look as children to those older than us absolutely Um, which is a really sad discovery, but it is what it is. And um, I think, yeah, the more that it is discussed and the more that we can share it as an experience, the the lighter the burden becomes for each individual. I'm sitting here listening and obviously a big piece of it is resonating with you. Is part of the issue that that if, you know, as you said, everyone goes through this, that when you are feeling down or, you know, if talking about it, it that's actually part of the burden is that you, you feel like, yeah. hey, my friends aren't going through this, you know, that I can't talk to anyone about this and therefore it almost compounds everything else you've got going on. It's really tricky. I think um, from my experience, I'm not great at asking for help um, because I don't want to take from anyone's cup I really like the cup analogy um you know I wouldn't ask anyone to give from their cup to me if they weren't already coping well 
um, and because I know that these experiences are so common in people asking someone to give you help when they're not helping themselves can be really exhausting um, I know that it's really hard to know what's the right thing to say to someone when they do reach out to help for help um, and so quite often you end up making them feel more uncomfortable and then you just feel uncomfortable yourself and it's sort of a loose it's, it's situation. A spiral of uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and quite often, you know, when you are feeling really depressed, it sounds really horrible, but the pretty quotes don't make a difference. Um, in my experience, the biggest thing that makes a difference is just saying, how can I help you? Or just someone being there for you. But when you're the person that's trying to, to give the advice, it is really hard to know how to help that person. Um, yeah, it's just, it's such a hard situation to handle on either end. And I think it's it's always going to be that way. But mm. just jumping back to what you said before about breaking down those barriers or sort of just releasing the stigma behind it. Mm. It sort of sounds like if more people are aware of almost exactly what you said before about you know, perhaps it's not even how can I help, it's just, you know, you know what's going on like i'm here to have a chat it's mm. almost like if if people identify that their friends are you know in a bad spot or having a rough time that mm. just asking that question or i almost see it as a release valve as you know yeah. you said before it's almost like just having a chat to someone yeah is it is it you know could make a big difference yeah and i think what it does too is encourages the person who's going through it to think about what does work for them because it's very easy to sit there and wallow in it and think this is never going to get better. There's nothing that can help me. Nothing's making it feel any better. But when someone does create the conversation and you have a chance to get the thoughts out of your head, then you might come across something and think, oh, I feel a lot better when I go to the beach or I feel a lot better when I get away from the city and the chaos or I feel a lot better when I go for a run. Um, that you might not have come up with those solutions or those ideas if you were just sitting there by yourself ruminating on the same thing over and over again i remember something you know i can't say that i have been fully depressed or anything like that but having gone through some tough times over the past 24 months i remember somebody somebody told me or i heard it on a podcast that it was as you go through day to day obviously a very tough time but to make a note of the things that make you feel above a, a four out of ten mm -hmm. and that to make a note of, of when you do that as you said if it's going for a walk along the beach or mm -hmm. going for a run going for a ride that way you sort of know that look if you do dip back below a three out of ten here's a sort of range mm -hmm. of strategies or things you can do to yeah to, to help that so. yeah and that's going to look different for everybody too i think um you know for me personally I do tend to isolate, but I'm quite introverted. And so a lot of the things that make me feel better don't involve being around other people. Um, I think there's a big pressure to, to feel good about certain things. Um, and social media is really good at sort of spreading ideas. But a lot of the time that is, you know, reaching out to a friend or going to a cafe or um, sitting with a loved one or just just ideas that it, it's not a um, one size fits all i guess is what i'm trying to say it's you have to recognize that whatever makes you feel better is okay and you have to be gentle with yourself and remove those expectations and those standards because your experience is your experience and your experience was discovering this endurance addiction in a mm -hmm. way when we did chat previously yeah you, you said that there was a bit of a relief for you and a release when you did start running and, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned that yeah we don't, not to fast forward through time but that the relationship between your mental health and running such the endurance events mm -hmm. became almost tipped over to the other side as well it's almost like a, at what point does do you need to increase that hit of running to sort of escape yeah. everything else that's going on? So yeah. I'm interested in in your relationship from that aspect. I'm still very much learning. <laughs> I definitely haven't found the right balance um, yet. I think I, I find it sometimes, but then 
other times I still dip back down um, because I do feel like my identity is very much tied to my label as an endurance runner. Um, I don't know whether I'd say athlete, but endurance runner, definitely. And so if I'm not doing those things, if I'm not having those adventures, then who am I? Um, especially with social media and, and I am quite open about what I do. I like sharing what I do. Um, if I'm not doing those things and achieving those things and, and pushing my limits constantly, then what am I contributing to the world? Why am I special? Why do I stand out? Um, and I know too that with always craving those achievements and craving that thrill that I get from going that little bit further or pushing through feeling crappy or doing something that would normally take people three days in yeah. one day, you know, it's, I, it's, I'm always hungry for it and I'm never satisfied, but that's the limit when I am very stubborn and the, my mental side of things is very fit and that's a real asset, but your body doesn't always comply and I guess for me that resulted in 12 months ago getting a stress fracture in my femur. I literally ran myself into breaking a bone because I was able to mentally block out the fact that I was hurting myself because I needed that fix constantly. You mentioned when we caught up previously that, and I, I wrote it down as a quote, you said, I do endurance because I have control over something. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Um, I guess anyone with a mental health experience, whether it's a previous or current uh, condition, feels like some of that control is taken away from them, that they become their depression or their addiction or their anxiety and that it is the hand that's driving them. Um, and I have felt like that for a lot of my life, you know, that, that control has ebbed and flowed. Sometimes I am in control, but a lot of the time I feel like there's a cloud hanging over me or that I am somehow running on that sense of anxiety. Um, and it is really hard to bring that back when that's a constant experience. And so with running, I guess it's my opportunity to, to, to take that control back and to steer where I'm going and that when I feel like things are getting hard or I'm going through a dark patch or my legs don't want to keep turning over, I'm in control of that. Um, and there's nothing limiting me except myself. And if I can push through that, if I can be strong through that, then I can push through anything, especially when the challenges always get harder, that shows to me that I'm capable and I really rely on that, which is a good and a bad thing um, when that's always where I get that sense of control back from. Um, but it does. It does teach me that I am capable. And I think that's a really important lesson for everyone. I can certainly see that that, yeah, at the end of the day, it's you and your body and your mind and the mm -hmm. clock or the distance. So, yeah, you can achieve that outcome. Mm hmm you know in in the best capacity but mm. i guess in that instance the only person or the only thing that's setting the limits is me there's no i i am guiding it yeah. there's no entirely. external factors or yeah. external people but you yeah. also did mention that it's it's a bad thing in a way and again something that you also mentioned to me was that finding that balance is is really important that you're not using sport or running in your example mm -hmm. for the wrong reason mm -hmm. is there any example where again it sounds like you've gone along this journey yep running's really great for my mental health let's see how far we can go let's see how far we can go mm -hmm. and then as you mentioned if it is obviously breaking the body then that takes the running away from you or if it is mm -hmm. getting too caught up in in pushing this limit you said yeah the balance is really important but mm -hmm. that it also does give you the opportunity to push it too far. You can get caught up. Mm -hmm. So where's the limit for Annie? <laughs> um, I would say I haven't found it, but there's definitely times where my body has said no and pushed back in a lot of different ways. I think the mind is so powerful 
and when the body is trying to tell you to rest it won't always be an injury it will be a cold or an upset stomach or a headache or a sore throat or there's some way for it to tell you it's not always a very obvious injury like a stress fracture and I think limits are are always changing and so we have to be we have to learn to be very avid listeners I guess very intuitive to the messages that our body is sending us and I mean, like I was saying previously, the body doesn't understand stress other than that's what it is. It's not physical or mental. And so if you've got a lot of stress coming from work or relationships, your training isn't going to be able to continue as it has without some sort of compromise. And I guess as someone who is constantly seeking the limit, I will always teeter on that edge of too much or too little in my mind as well. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like it's an incredibly vicious cycle where mm-hmm. you're you know, dealing with some things mentally. You, you know, have the opportunity to use running or endurance athletes or riding as a really powerful way to address that. Mm-hmm. Get yourself sort of back into a really good space mm-hmm. and then keep trying to improve things to sort of tick yourself over a five out of ten. Yep. Lose control perhaps of where that limit is and therefore get an injury yeah and then that takes away this really powerful aspect yeah and so it's almost like it's the chicken and the egg sort of thing where yeah that that balance is really important and as you said like i'm not I'm trying to i feel like if you can answer this question that i'm about to ask that you have a lot of people paying you a lot of money but i know you, <laughs> Bring it on. I know you said that you haven't i think finding the balance for anyone not just you here right now but mm-hmm. i think finding the balance for anyone is that's the key but given you know you're on your journey now and you've you've had some recent downs but also on the way back up which Mm -hmm. is great are there any specific strategies recognizing that everyone's different but for you personally are there any specific ways that that you can be mindful of where you are on your your journey in terms of getting back to a good space but also in i guess keeping a bit of perspective in terms of yeah as you said you got out for a run this morning this could continue for a month Mm -hmm. how do you keep yourself in check now to ensure that you're staying in a really good spot and like I said I know that's such a tough question it's a very tough question um and I think I would have a different answer tomorrow than today and next week than today and it is always changing um which I guess comes back to the fact that you just have to listen um but the other really important thing um that I have started to sort of apply quite regularly is asking myself why why am I out there? Why am I doing this? Why have I entered that race? Why am I getting out of bed? Why am I going to see this person? Why am I doing this podcast? (laughs) Um, And I think you have to be genuine with yourself. And that's not something that everyone's comfortable doing. You have to put yourself in an uncomfortable space and dig deep and answer the questions honestly because at the end of the day if you can't answer that honestly for yourself then are you happy are you going to be happy um and so i i do ask myself you know this morning why am i running 30ks when i could be having a coffee right now (laughs) um and i've got a big race coming up and it is really scary and i have questioned why am i doing it and i've gone back and forth about whether I actually want to turn up to the start line. Um, And there were a long few months there last year where I was asking myself, why am I getting out of bed? And I think that's that's what got me through. Only because you've said so, I want to just prod a little bit Mm, further. Go for it. You're talking about finding the why or just being mindful of of your why Mm -hmm. Uh, i'm not going to ask you what your why is because that is that is personal but what i want to know is you know for for everyone out there i think it's i think what i want to know is when when do you do that i know for me like some days i work on the computer quite a fair bit Mm -hmm. i can get up turn the computer on have breakfast sit on my phone jump straight up on the computer emails work Mm -hmm. yeah maybe get out for a ride but then i get straight back upload it to strava jump back on the computer to do some work Mm -hmm. jump in the shower probably on my phone there in the shower jump into bed on my phone again like i I, 
that's bad. That's shocking. And I, mm. I, I really hate that. So I'm very conscious these days of not doing that. But for me personally, I just don't find that I have the time to ask myself what, what the why is. So I'm interested from your perspective, like, is it getting up in the morning and practicing gratitude like what what are some of the things or when do you ask yourself these whys all the time there are plenty of opportunities there that you have to ask yourself those questions when you're on the bike when you're in the shower before you get out of bed you know when you go and make your coffee and you've got those five minutes of break time between jumping on the computer you said you hate it what are you doing about it you know, no, that's, that's yeah, this, this yeah. podcast is about you, remember? So maybe <laughs> let's, uh, let's deflect. Um, I think, you know, if something's not sitting right with you in your day to day, you have the power to change it. You always have the power to change it. You might be stuck in a job that you don't love 100% of the time, but it's a means to an end, whether that's it pays the bills to allow you to do what you love, or it's a certain step on a career path, or it is just ticking a box for now. But if you're just surviving and not thriving, what's the point? No, I, I think that's that. They are very, very good points. And for <laughs> me, yeah, I, I love the days when, um, I, you know, the phone is out of the bedroom or mm-hmm. breakfast is sitting there outside. You know, being mindful of oh, look, the you know the sun's out and about and the mm. birds, etc. So no, I, I definitely appreciate that. But yeah, are, are there moments for you specific? Like, do you have a routine in place or are there there moments or are you just sort of really flexible in terms of you're walking down to this podcast today? Mm. It's that's when you're sort of thinking about, is there anything specific for Annie? I'm not. I, uh, I don't have a routine or a structure. Um, and like I said, I'm very privileged that I am a full-time student and I work part-time. I have a lot of free time. I'm not someone that has a very full social schedule because I am quite introverted and I do need a lot of time to myself to replenish. But I know that I have to make that time for myself as well. That, that's what keeps me going and that's how I can handle turning up each day. I think it's the most important times to ask yourself those questions are when you're struggling, are when it's not when it's not inherently clear what your why is and what that answer is. And that's been, you know, particularly at the forefront of my mind going into this race. I think it if you ask yourself enough, it's also a habit. But that's, I mean, that's my coping mechanism. That's what I find works for me. I think that it sounds really corny and it is a cliche, but you will always find time for the things that you love. And I think you should always find time for the things that are important, for the things that make you happy. It's going to look different for everyone. But for me, that is staying in check with my mental health. And I guess (laughs) probing the, the discomfort and figuring that out and running yeah. yeah that's when i have the time to ask myself so actually using this thing that you found you really love and have a passion for is, mm-hmm. is that moment so, mm-hmm. um, a lot of the time when i'm running i'm not thinking about anything <laughs> i think feel like it sounds like that's the joy though. it sounds like that's that's one of the best bits is that mm. it is that opportunity to switch off and yep. soak up the surroundings and be and, present yeah. and not have my face in a screen um and just to soak it up and be in a beautiful place. You mentioned the term before, mental fitness. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're sort of getting to the other side of the equation now. Mm-hmm. What does the term mental fitness mean to you? Um, developing that mental strength, I guess, the resilience. I think if you spend 15 hours a week going and doing your training, whether that's rehab, gym sessions, track sessions, runs, whatever, whether you're a runner, swimmer, cyclist, whatever sport you do, you spend X amount of hours on your physical fitness and you think the more I train, the more efficiently I train, that's going to equal a better performance. If you're not mentally there, you're always going to be limited. If you are the fittest you've ever been, but you turn up and you're down in the dumps or you just genuinely don't think you can do it, if you don't think you can run that pace or you don't think you can beat that person you're not going to your body's not going to turn up if your mind doesn't turn up and that's particularly important for endurance sport because you've got three eight twelve hours out there more than that there are people running ridiculous lengths now you're going to have highs and lows 
if every time you reach a low, you just pull out, you sit down, you throw a tantrum, you're never going to finish a race. And what kind of athlete are you going to be? What kind of experience are you going to have as a, as a racer, as a runner? Um, and you do, you do have to work on that mental fitness. Um, and that feeds back into everything else too. You know, I, I find that I'm more resilient in other situations because of the mental fitness that I've worked on for my running. At, at work and, and out yeah. socially, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's a two-way relationship. Um, but it's something that we discount and don't consider a lot of the time because you don't notice an obvious change. It's not like you can look at yourself or look at someone else and say, wow, your brain's looking really good today. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's something that's hidden and that isn't as obvious. And so we don't think that it's as important. But I would say endurance sport, 80% mental, 20% physical. It, you just keep your legs turning over. You've got to keep your head in check. Absolutely. Do you feel like much the same as the running groups, but in, in that same way that you said before about it, it's not as evident? Do you feel like there's been an explosion of focus on mental health and mental fitness, as you said, in the past year, the past five years? I feel like there's almost exactly as you said, the train, the physical training is almost like that's a, a non-negotiable now. Like that, mm-hmm. that's it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Whereas you have to excuse. I'm not sure actually. We haven't really spoken about if you're an AFL fan or <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Uh, not directly. No, I okay. am because of a certain housemate. <laughs> oh, of course, yes. Yeah, well, I don't uh, often have a choice. <laughs> that's unfortunate that uh, West Coast is <laughs> at the forum. I know I, I go for Richmond. Um, which Top is no cats. surprise, <laughs> Not the cat, oh, yuck. Um, but I know that Dustin Martin is, is quite adamant on, I think it was Pilates or yoga that he mm-hmm. undertook and it was also boxing, um, obviously both relatively physical, but the yeah. main aspect that he spoke about was the power that it had in regards to his mental well-being and mm-hmm. arguably the best one of the best players in the competition now as well mm-hmm. so do you think that that there has been an emergence of focus on that mental health aspect of sport yeah i think so i mean obviously i'm quite biased i'm studying yeah. psychology because i want to become a sports psychologist so i'm a lot more attuned to it than maybe other people are but I do, I do think so. Um, I know that there are a few AFL teams now who have a specific psychologist who just works with the team, um, which is a new addition. I mean, that would never be have been a consideration 10 years ago, especially in such a um, masculine sport where it's probably wasn't cool to talk about your feelings. It's probably not still cool to talk about your feelings, but... Um, I do think that it is a lot more accepted and acknowledged. Um, yeah, especially, I mean, with AFL as a specific example, you've got a lot of guys there who have drinking problems and who abuse drugs, whether that's during or after their career. If their mental health was addressed more when they were playing and as they were developing athletes, you wouldn't have nearly as many of those issues. So I think that it, um, it is becoming... Uh, a bigger consideration and that taboo is being lifted as more conversations are had yeah not that it's a good gauge but facebook comments are something that i probably read a little bit too much of but i like to use them as as the as that gauge for what society thinks and whenever an afl player you know does sort of speak out and say look i've i've got a mental health problem i need Mm -hmm. to deal with that it's been sort of interesting the shift in that public perception that instead of being like hey you're weak step up to a lot of again not that it's a good gauge by any means but that the facebook comments are actually like i hope you get better soon like that mental mm. health isn't something to joke about so yeah you know almost in that roundabout way what you're talking about before in regards to just raising awareness of mental health yeah do you feel like progress is being made in terms of that you know that I, I don't want to get into that that overarching like there are movements like are you okay etc that, mm-hmm. that are doing good things out mm-hmm. there but you know for, for that on the ground whether it's asking a mate or for recognize do you feel like there is progress being made in the mental health space i do i definitely think there are more sort of like campaigns um and stuff that that bring it to the fore 
I do think that we are limiting ourselves. We don't go as far in the conversation as what we should, which is hard. I mean, you've got to you've got to take the first step before you take the second and the third. And we don't want to overwhelm people and throw too much at them too soon. But I do think that a lot of those campaigns fall short because they don't tell you how to handle it when someone says, no, I'm not okay. And that's probably just as valuable or recognizing the signs before you ask the question. Because like I said, I'm not good at reaching out for help. I'm definitely guilty of saying, yeah, I'm fine and turning up and putting on a good face. But I think progress is definitely happening um, and it is great. And I certainly don't want to be a downer and say, well, it's not good enough progress or it's not enough progress because it still counts for something. It's still sowing the seed in people's minds and creating conversation and any conversation is good. I don't want to walk away from today wishing that I asked you a question. Mm -hmm. Not to to take a step back in in the flow of this chat, but something that, that I want to know if you're okay to share is what does depression look like for Annie and I'm sorry to ask no. but I know that there is I know that of, of anyone you would be more than happy to ask and more so you know if it's perhaps a bit easier is there a, a lowest point for you yeah yeah are you okay um, to share yeah absolutely yeah. no it's a good question and it's probably not a question that gets asked enough but you do have to have a comfortable relationship for that conversation to happen. So thank you for asking. Yeah, and I think the scary thing is with depression is that you'll reach a lowest point, but you know it can always get lower. And it's scary when you do start feeling a little bit better because the better you feel, the further you have to fall back again. So recovery is actually a really scary process. And I know that because depression has been something that has been very prevalent to me my whole life it's my safe space I am almost more comfortable being depressed than I am being better or being okay depression for me feels like just losing my spark I will always on the outside almost always look like I'm okay Um, I did a lot of drama as a kid. I was in hospitality for a long time. I know how to put on a face. Um, I know how to smile in a way that convinces people that I'm okay. But on the inside, it looks like just not feeling like things will ever be better and not believing when people say, it does, you'll get stronger out of this. It's a real genuine belief that this is my constant state. It outwardly will look like I am living a great life and I'm going on all these amazing adventures and I'm doing a whole lot of travel and I'm so independent. And don't get me wrong, there is a genuine love of those things. But a big motivator behind that too is that I go and put myself in these beautiful places because life doesn't feel beautiful otherwise because I go and do those things and life is simple and I wake up with the sun and I have a muesli bar for breakfast and I go and do a run and then I go and lay on the beach and I read my book and I don't have to put on that face and I don't have to worry about meeting other people's expectations or ticking any boxes and everything is just simple. And so it's I almost feel ungrateful when I have these candid conversations because outwardly I look like I'm kicking all these goals. But that's me trying to convince myself that waking up tomorrow is worthwhile. That's me trying to make an answer to my why. Why is it worth getting up tomorrow? Why is it worth persevering? Why do I keep turning up each day when it's a very genuine feeling that I will always be living with this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know you sort of mentioned it before, but yeah, thank you for <laughs> obviously <laughs> sharing that. It's obviously um, tough for anyone. But as I've sort of talked about a couple of times, that 
raising that awareness or breaking down the barrier as you said you know you put on a brave face and you naturally a bubbly person even though things behind the scenes might not look like that but i feel like that's also a common a common thing that a lot Mm -hmm. of people do you know you don't want to tell your friends or your family that you're in a rough place so Mm. yeah it's sort of I, i think again obviously people listening to this will be like yeah i've seen annie out and about or i see annie at a run and she's always jumping about or don't think that it's all fake though i am a grateful person and i am a hopeful person and there is always a part of my mind that does have ideas for the future and aspirations and i do think that i am capable of being strong enough to be happy and to cope and yeah I don't want to come across as being ungrateful I guess for the opportunities no, definitely not and the privilege that I have as well no definitely not and I think a big part of it I think the really powerful thing out of today's chat is that you know if there's even one person listening to this it's like yeah look I feel like shit I'm going to reach out to someone Mm -hmm. today or tomorrow so no Mm -hmm. I think that speaks volumes to yourself but you know a part of it what I particularly love about you know you and and your candidness is that it does open up the opportunity for others who are going through a rough time to Mm -hmm. to speak out is that something that you've found that I'm not sure if you have any friends or you mentioned about your parents before you know obviously working in that space but have you I wrote down the note from our previous chat about encouraging others and whether that Mm -hmm. is through, you know, broadly raising awareness. But have you ever found that you've you've been able to chat to someone who is going through a rough time and sort of help them through just because of your experience and because Mm. of your candidness? Mm. I would hope so. Um, I certainly have had conversations with other people and I would hope that they feel like and others feel like they can come to me and use my experience for their benefit. Um, I do feel sometimes like I'm a little bit wise beyond my years and that's because of what I've been through. And I don't want to put anyone off, but I do think it's very important to recognise that you have to be filling up your own cup while giving to other people and that someone that's mentally unwell or not doing so great might not always offer the best advice because their words might be a little bit overshadowed by what they're going through. But I'm always willing to have conversations. Um, I'm always open to talking about my experience and I do hope that it can help other people because that's what adds a positive element to it, I guess. I wouldn't say that it makes it worthwhile going through it, but um, if you could sort of take a silver lining, I guess, then that's great and that does help add to that why of waking up in the morning. And it sounds like you've even doubled down on that. You mentioned about your studies before Mm -hmm. too, that you're actually studying psychology now. Mm -hmm. And that, again, it's not that it's a silver lining by any stretch, but but yeah, obviously your own experience and your interest in in the subject of the mind, Mm -hmm. um, both positive and negative, has actually informed your career path at this date. How how is the study going? And It's great. It's a little weird going back after a five-year hiatus. I'm technically a mature age student, which is not a great title to have. So you're the one that sits up the front and asks all the annoying questions. Oh, I ask all the questions, questions. yeah. 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 Um, (laughs) I'm the one that keeps everyone at the lecture 10 minutes later. Oh, no. Um, No, 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 I'm not. Um, I am partly studying it so I can try and figure myself out. I think that's quite a common element with anyone studying psychology. But, yeah, I'm really, really enjoying it. And it does give me hope for the future, which is really nice. It's nice to look forward to something again. Um, It's a long slog. It takes six years to become a registered clinical psych. Um, But you do have a lot of responsibility as someone who sits there and listens to someone's outpouring of their emotions and their mind. Um, So it's not something I take lightly, but I do really look forward to whatever avenue it takes, takes me down and whatever doors it opens up. And that is the the ideal career path is is get through the six years and then become a, a clinical psychologist and sports psych is my ultimate goal, gotcha. um, which is a pretty niche area, but maybe not so much as people think. I know that it's going to take me a little while to get there, so I know that I may work in other fields first, which is fine. I find a lot of different aspects of 
other areas interesting but yeah essentially I guess I want to help people work on that mental fitness I want to work on team dynamics I want to work on injury recovery Um, young athletes who get picked up by these selection crews who don't have the opportunity to think about life outside of their sport I want to help prepare them for the fact that there's a world out there and a life beyond that that doesn't revolve around their training schedule I'd love to work with endurance athletes and follow, I guess, the the racing schedule around North America, but uh, that's a bit of a pipe dream, so we'll see how that goes. Oh, I think that's absolutely super that this, this experience, but also this interest for you is also what's shaping a career path. And I can tell just from the way that you're sitting here and talking about it, that, that it is something to look forward to, that it's mm. not just, hey, I'm doing this to fill a, a mm. gap or fill a social norm, that as I said, you're doubling down and it's it's something to look forward to in, <laughs> in six years, in 10 years sort of thing. So no, I think yeah. that that's absolutely incredible so. i'm such a nerd <laughs> i actually really look forward to like writing my essays and reading my text no <laughs> that's that's so good that's that's very very good so i'm gonna have to rein you in just i wanted to touch on this this next sort of area very quickly but it is something that i'm actually going to flesh out with you and and with others in, mm-hmm. at a future day but you, along with along with your studies and running the mm-hmm. female aspect of mm-hmm. sport is also something that i believe you're very passionate about mm-hmm. how's and look we're, we're jumping from some big topics here so <laughs> how do you think that I guess even if you want to tie the two together in terms of that that mental health but also the emergence of of female sports and and how Mm -hmm. how that's progressing how do you think things sit and and look I'll give you a specific one I'll make things a little bit easier you and I had a really great chat last time in regards to raising awareness particularly about young females in regards to um, if they are taking on elite sport or semi-elite sort of sport Mm -hmm. What was your experience of that like, you know, obviously getting into running and and being a female athlete on a relatively big stage? I think I probably couldn't even count on two hands the amount of times that someone has said to me, oh, you don't have the body of an endurance athlete. And that's hit really hard, you know, as someone who has had issues around eating. And I think that's very, very common with female athletes. I really struggled with the idea that I didn't fit that image. Um, But at the end of the day, I can run further than any other girl I know. So does it matter that I'm not a stick figure, that I look emaciated? I really like a burger at the end of the day. (laughs) And I'm a much nicer person to be around now that I let myself eat those burgers. But, um, yeah, it is a startlingly high number of of females that jeopardise their performance in sport because they feel like they have to ascribe to these expectations of what they look like. Where do you think these expectations are coming from? Everywhere. Um, I think, I mean, obviously a lot of social media, and that's probably the primary one, but also the fact that because so many other females are playing into it, you're surrounded by role models that outwardly look like they naturally have this shape or that that's what their body does when they're training in that way. But because we don't feel comfortable talking about it, we don't know that they're also struggling. And so it is that negative feedback again where, oh, I I look up to this figure who's who's really skinny, you know, with endurance sport, that tends to be the, the body shape. That's what I should aspire to look like. But I think there are great things happening in, in women in sport, um, but it's an issue that really, really needs to be addressed. And again, that conversation needs to be had. I know for myself, it's still something that I struggle with. I still really struggle not to to want to be in that massive deficit at the end of the day. I still feel a lot of guilt around what I eat. Um, I still poke and prod and pinch areas and and don't think that I fit that image. And I have to remind myself, I'm strong, I'm fit, I am capable. I don't want to discount what you're saying, but like agree 200 percent but it, mm-hmm. it almost sounds like you're coming back to just happiness like mm-hmm. that that there are you know yeah whether it is the eating side of things or the you know the female 
reproductive health or Mm -hmm. the mental health for female athletes and again i'm sort of hesitant because i do want to delve into this in a separate podcast Mm -hmm. you know both with yourself and and a really good group but yeah it just sounds like what we and i hate harping back to social media but quite often what you see is these vibrant happy you know both male and female athletes or influencers on social media who have what appears to be this great life and that this is what we should all aspire to whereas perhaps they're not actually you know you don't know almost in like what you said before that they might be incredibly miserable but it's just this they're projecting the exact image that they want you to receive it's not completely honest it's never completely honest they have taken 300 photos to post that one the captions carefully crafted it's we just can't always take it as gospel you always have to take it with a grain of salt this is the million dollar question again i've asked you two today but how how do we get away from that and again not not, this is you know i did mention about the female side of things but Mm. as, as everyone how do how do you think we move away from is it the responsibility of the influences of the pro athlete to sort of say look i feel like shit and i've spoke with scotty and i spoke about this you know he sort of said that he has this hesitation to post on social media when he's injured or you yeah. know when he's not fit because it's like no look i feel like i don't want to show like i always want to inspire people and want to yeah. uplift people but then it's almost again this chicken in the egg where you, yeah. you're sort of posting this false yeah. aspect of yourself and there is such a thing as toxic positivity too you don't always have to be positive it it's not natural And as an athlete, you don't always have to be performing. As athletes, we, (laughs) we, you're always on that precipice of overreaching and then pulling back. And that's how you grow. That's how you get fitter. But you're not always going to get it right. And something is going to go wrong at some point. I don't know any athlete ever, any person who does sport more than once a week who hasn't had some sort of issue Um, I think we have to be real. I mean, yes, it does come to the responsibility of the influencer or the person that's posting or the person that's the role model. But I think as um, consumers, we also just have to question things more. You can't just look at something and just say, oh, I've just seen one person post this. It must be correct. We have to question what's behind that. What's between the lines there? Almost like... For me, it sounds like in a completely different way to the way that we talked about it before, but it, it comes back to the why. That Look, at the end of the day, this the influencer or the athlete can post whatever they want, and if mm-hmm. they're not happy, that's up to them. But yeah, the, the, the influencer does have the responsibility, but also us, as you said, as the consumer. It's mm-hmm. just like, well, you know, why why does this make me feel upset about myself Mm -hmm. so perhaps that that's also a thing is that yeah yeah at the end of the day if we are looking at these images or these videos or whatever it is these inspirational captions that seem Mm. to be doing the rounds on on all platforms it's it's a matter of look i take this on board but you know if i'm to achieve this this look or this you know what's why like why do i want this it's why and it's having conversations and that comes down to having a conversation with yourself quite often i mean i've said it i think i've used the term discomfort a lot but we can't be comfortable all the time growth doesn't happen in your safe space you have to ask yourself exactly why is this making me feel uncomfortable um why am i trying to aspire to that why do i want to try and emanate this person question it i'm definitely looking forward to um to gauging a little bit more of this of of that specific element with you but i've got two more Mm -hmm. this one i'm definitely gonna have to rein you in on because i feel like you can talk about it for (laughs) for weeks you mentioned it before about sitting on a beach and soaking up a place but i want to i think i think i'm gonna ask or i have asked every every athlete this question so Mm -hmm. far but tell me as briefly as possible about your love for tassie you obviously have spent probably you know as much time as anyone that i know out in the the rural areas the untouched mm-hmm. areas of tassie what is it about this place and, and particularly given that you've traveled around the world and lived overseas as mm-hmm. well you're here in tassie now what is it that's a really good question and i think i just think that it's in such a small area it's got so much to offer it varies so much you've got the wild west coast which is completely untamed you've got the bluest blue waters and the whitest sands on the east coast red soil up north it 
you don't have to go too far from home to see something really, really special. And we are so lucky to have that. I think it was very cool when I was in college to want to move overseas or interstate and Tassie was just really boring. And I think, you know, during COVID, everyone was like, oh, I can't wait to travel again. I can't wait to go on a plane. But it's right on our doorstep, you know, drive two, three hours it costs less than a plane ticket and I promise you'll be awestruck. Like there are spots in Tassie that still absolutely take my breath away. I'm not paid to say anything and I know it sounds really corny, but I just love Tassie and I don't think that I'll ever stop wanting to explore it. I almost threw your COVID situation on its head where we had those incentives to get out and about. I know personally, like I've always grown up on Bruni but Nan and Pop sold their, their home down there recently. But I feel like as, you know, obviously as devastating as COVID was and still is, it was such mm-hmm. a good opportunity for people to be like, yeah, I'm going to boost it to Bishino and, and check yeah. out that area. So Yeah, there were definitely a lot of positive aspects that came out of COVID. We were very scared to begin with, but um, yeah, it's it was a great motivator to go and explore your backyard because Tassie is small, but it's not limited in any means. If you could perhaps share, I want to say, three of your favourite running locations in Tassie, where would mm-hmm. they be? This is an on-the-spot question. Mm-hmm. I didn't, didn't give any of this on um, I spend a lot of time running up on the Mean Range. It's, Whereabouts is the Mean, just for those not familiar? So the Mean's on the eastern shore in Hobart, uh, on the way to the airport. It's the big bushy hill sort of overlooks Bell Reef, and there's a particular spot on a cliff top up there and you can look out to Mount Wellington and you look down on the city and it's always beautiful. I always have to stop and just soak it in and I never get tired of that. Um, I love the Tasman Peninsula as well. The geology down there is insane and you really don't have to go very far to get a view of that. Um, there's a few different loops down there but the Cape Pillar um, run is definitely up there on my list. You can stop out there on the blade and have a little snack and look at the seals. So I can definitely recommend that. And as for the third, I'd have to say the walls of Jerusalem. Um, And that's special to me because I really grew up in the back of my dad's backpack. (laughs) I think there's a family story where when I was three years old, I walked the whole way out. And it was probably then that my stubbornness became very clear (laughs) to everyone in my family, but it is, really special it's quite majestic and i roll my eyes at that because it's a bit of a cliche term to use but um it really does give you a sense that you could be literally anywhere and that there's tazzy tigers just roaming around somewhere out of uh, out of view i used to say that i wanted to get married there and i wanted to have my ashes spread there which is you know, the high and low. (laughs) That's a very stark contrast. (laughs) Yeah. But again, just somewhere that is always special and that I never tire of. So I haven't actually been, haven't actually been, but um, it could definitely be on the list given Mm -hmm. you've sold it there and hopefully you don't (laughs) run into too many ashes on my travels. (laughs) Or too many weddings. Or too many weddings. But um, look, the last one I've got for you, again, a bit of an on the spot one, but um, said a few times, obviously incredibly appreciative of, of you spending the time to chat today particularly about such a a candid topic um in mental health as opposed to endurance athletes um but i you mentioned about finding your why before coming today um Mm -hmm. i was just wondering yeah what it was what it is about the tassie athlete that you know apart from the fact that we are friends um Mm -hmm. what is it about the tassie athlete as a platform that you know that made you come along today or even that made you follow on instagram is there anything that you think is a positive or a negative out of the tassie (laughs) athlete you've been i don't think i have any negatives (laughs) uh, uh could maybe have a few more girls on there but you know we are outweighed a little bit i think we often get overlooked as Tasmanians and we have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot of talent. We have a lot of representatives in a fairly diverse uh, range of, of sports and fields. And I think that's it's great that you celebrate that and that you draw attention to it. There are a lot of people who are out there doing very cool things, whether that's someone who is top of their field, like Scotty, um, or someone that just gets out there in the morning and plods along you know the average joe 
there are a lot of people just like me and less, I guess, public figures that go and do these multi-day runs or these 12 hour missions and they're completely unassuming. I just think that's awesome. And Tassie athletes drawing attention to that. Um, I honestly really look forward to seeing what you guys do. I think it's great. Looking forward to seeing some more average Joes feature on, <laughs> on the Tassie athlete. No, that's good. Um, average Joes and average Joannes. Average jo- <laughs> As long as there's no average Karens, we're okay. Oh, no, so- none of the Karens. None of the Karens. <laughs> Just to round things off, you mentioned about a race coming up. Are you okay to share? Yep. Yeah, What? where can we see you in the future? Um, well, probably on the side of a track somewhere with a broken ankle, um, but fingers, fingers crossed, crossed it doesn't happen. Um, so just over two weeks ago, I've got the Cradle Run, which is the full traverse of the Overland Track, all 80-something Ks of it. It'll be the longest run that I've done um, and by far the most technical and the longest in terms of time out on course. So I'm probably a little bit more afraid than I am excited, but I think that's healthy and normal. It's a a part of Tassie and a part of the world that I love and am really excited to go and visit in that way um, and share that experience with the other crazy people who are out there doing it. It's not a big cohort of people who get to enter. You do have to qualify for it. Um, and I'm really honoured that I have the opportunity to do it, especially as someone quite young in the sport. I am looking forward to it being over, but I also look forward to the suffering and the whole thing, the highs and lows. I know not all of it's going to be pretty, and that is kind of part of the lure for me as well. It sounds like it's going to be an absolute slog, but um, <laughs> you, you've sold it, you've sold it. Annie, thank you so much again for the time today. Is there anything Absolute else you'd like pleasure. to add? Oh, honestly... I don't know. Endurance sport's just about the snacks, really. Who are we kidding? The snacks. This is the, the honest <laughs> lowdown on endurance That's sports. That's the secret. There's the you mental aspect. You just really got to like food okay. and be very stubborn. Food and coffee, I believe. Oh, food and coffee. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm really just run on caffeine. <laughs> what's the go-to snack? And I feel like it's a very fitting way to, to end the chat today. What's the go-to snack? Oh, pre-run, mid-run, post-run. Give me all of them. Pre-run, coffee and a banana. Mid run, uh, I have just gotten on to the mashed potato. Mashed potato? Yeah, yep, can recommend. And spring energy gels, all natural ingredients, which is a lot nicer on the stomach. Post run, just give me fries. <laughs> a big old bowl fries and a of very, very salty fries. I'm not sure if this will make the final cut, but rumour has it that your housemate has also delved into the peanut butter and jam sandwiches mid run. <laughs> just jam. Just jam. Just okay, jam. sorry, sorry, Cole. Yep. Yeah, he introduced me to the potatoes, though, so that's a secret handed down from <laughs> from one housemate to the next. But, uh, yeah, jam sandwiches. I haven't um, dabbled yet, but maybe that's uh, in the future. I'm told you're not allowed to have the jam sandwiches unless you run with the, the belt as well, with the bum bag. I'm yet to get him onto the hydration pack. Okay. Apparently that's very, very uncool. Um, it's very practical though, so never say never. Th- I'd say give him 12 months I think, and he'll be in the hydration uh, pack. I think he is a little bit of a sucker for the... He's happy to run the bum bag and the sandwiches, but the boys do give him a bit of a hard time. So if he went to the You've hydration pack, I'm not sure. It's a got pretty, to become comfortable with the discomfort. It's a pretty pretty aggressive group of, of runners oh, between I'm well aware. Andy <laughs> Allison, Sam Field um, and <laughs> Bailey. I think they all give Cobb a bit of a hard time. It's one we... of the things I do like about trial running is it's very less appearance oriented. <laughs> we don't have to match our tops to our shoes, <laughs> have our hair perfectly slipped back. You go on Instagram any Sunday and guaranteed that someone's giving Cobb a, a bit of a hard time <laughs> on his looks. But uh, Cobb is probably the fittest out of that group at the moment. So who's laughing now? That's very true. He's certainly the fittest in the house. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Still the only one that's run a marathon. For now. <laughs>
A special thanks again to Annie for taking the time out to share with TA her journey with mental health, but also her background into endurance athletes and looking forward to seeing how she goes in those events over the next couple of months. The conversation with Annie, it's a really fitting transition into our next chat with Hobart-based distance runner Andy Allison, who also shares his journey with mental illness, but in particular with a focus on how things such as yoga and mindfulness really helped him overcome some of the ups and downs that are associated shaded with that and if you haven't already heard we've had a great chat with Izzy Flint as well as scientist Dr Joel Mason from the other side of the world and we're looking forward to some more podcasts very soon so thanks again for taking the time out to listen and thanks for your support of TA and just as we wrap things up obviously the topic of mental health and mental illness is quite tough for some people so if you or someone you know is having a bit of a hard time then you can get in touch with organizations such as Lifeline at lifeline.org.au or give them a call on 131114 for.